Good afternoon. I'm Shelley Zedek. I'm the Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and Faculty Welfare on this campus. Uh, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you to this event, the 16th Annual Lecture on Energy and the Environment. Uh, you may be wondering why I'm going to be doing the introductions of the Chair of the Energy and Resources Group, Dan Farber, for, because it's for some reason I'm the cognizant dean for this group. And we could have a whole special session on why that's so, but uh, I think we should get to the point of this evening, and that is the uh, lecture by Dr. Orville Schell. Uh, this series began in about 1990s, 91, by John Holdren, and this is the 16th uh, lecture. Um, the, the list is a long list of very distinguished uh, scholars from the campus and from off the campus. And so there's a long, at least 16 years is a long time for uh, this series. It's my pleasure to introduce Dan Farber, who is the chair of the Energy and Resources Group, his first year as chair. Uh, it was interesting to look at Dan's resume as I was thinking, trying to figure out how to introduce him uh, in a nutshell, so I don't take too much time up here. Um, but I don't know if this is true of the legal profession or not, but his pages are not numbered and his items are not numbered. But all I can tell you is there are many pages and many items to his background. <laughs> um, so I'll start in sort of the beginning, which is when Dan received his BA in philosophy in 1971, an MA in sociology in 1972, and a JD degree from the University of Illinois in 1975. So it's important to note that we have as the head, the chair of the Energy and Resources Group, someone who brings a philosophical, sociological, and legal perspective to environmental issues. Uh, how you make those merge, I guess, would be another topic um, for uh, an evening talk. Um, after getting his JD degree, uh, Dan clerked for two judges, first Judge Philip Tone of the US Court of Appeals, and then for Justice John Paul Stevens of the US Supreme Court. Uh, he's held two faculty positions, one at the, before coming to Berkeley, one at the University of Illinois, and one at Minnesota Law School. Uh, he's also been a visitor at Stanford, Harvard, and the University of Chicago Law Schools. And he came to Berkeley in 2002, 2001, when he became the director of the California Center on Environmental Law and Policy. Dan's list, as I said, his resume is quite long in terms of his writings and scholarship, but I want to note about at least four of his books, uh, Environmental Law, Cases and Materials, which has a very distinguished accomplishment in being in its, I believe, seventh edition. He also has another book, Environmental Law in a Nutshell, which is in its sixth edition. So you can see it's had tremendous impact in terms of being used by many law students and those interested in environmental issues. He has several other books and, as I said, a multiple list of uh, articles and reviews. His most recent scholarship focuses on the legal dimension of climate change. Um, I will end by saying that it's really impressive because uh, sometimes we think we're sort of isolated in some ways with environmental issues, but Dan's works have been translated in French Spanish and Japanese, at least those are the three languages that I could find. At first, I would, probably was giving him more credit than he might warrant. I thought he had written them in French, Spanish, and Japanese, but he clarified that they're translations of, of the, his original sources. So at this point, I'd like to bring Dan up here, and he's going to do the introductions of our distinguished speaker, Orville Schell. Dan? Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, yeah, there are a lot of pages, and even more footnotes, actually, uh, <laughs> than pages. Uh, as Shelley mentioned, this is my first year as chair of ERG, and this lecture is one of the uh, high points of the year uh, for ERG. Um, I have to say that the, uh, in this first year life at ERG has been even more stimulating uh, than I had hoped. Um, on the plus side has been the exciting opportunity to work 
with ERG's extraordinary multidisciplinary community of scholars and students. On the not so plus side has been the state of California's budget, uh, which has, but never mind, I won't. <laughs> That's something else we could spend a whole session on. Um, instead, our topic today is a top, has broader and in, in, indeed planetary significance. Uh, tonight's speaker addresses one of the most critical public policy issues of our time, how to engage China in the process of combating global climate change. This topic is not only timely, but closely connected with ERG's mission. Much of our work at ERG relates to climate change, and ERG faculty and students have done considerable work on sustainability issues in China and elsewhere in Asia. Uh, for many of you, Orville Schell needs no introduction as the former dean of the Berkeley Journalism School. Others of you know him through his writings. He has an extraordinary record of achievement, and time will allow me to hit only a few of the highlights. He holds degrees from Harvard, Stanford, and Berkeley. He has written for the leading newspapers and magazines of I was going to say our, uh, the nation, but in fact, of the world. Uh, from the New York Times to the New Yorker, uh, he has authored 14 books, nine on China, and is at work on a new book, An Interpretation of the Last Century of Chinese History. He has also been showered by honors, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Overseas Press Club Award, and the Harvard Stanford Shorenstein Prize in Asian Journalism. He now serves as the Asia Society's Arthur Ross Director and has been responsible for setting up the new Center on U.S.-China Relations in New York City. Before turning the microphone over to Orville, I would be remiss if I failed to thank the Ro Philip Roth Memorial Fund for helping to support this event. I'm particularly happy that his wife, Adrian, and family are in the audience tonight. Thank you. And now I hope you'll join me in welcoming. Well, thanks. It's, uh, it's uh, great to be here. It's a bit uh, like having an out-of-body experience to be back at this uh, podium in this room after having spent so many evenings here in the past as, as dean. Um, our topic tonight uh, is one that uh, I stumbled into, and stumbled into it through my interest in China. Uh, and it happened because I took a trip. My children were in school in Beijing, and I wanted to take them on a vacation one March, about two, three years ago. And we went up to northwest China to visit some Buddhist monasteries and grottos, and I was sort of dimly aware of where we were going. I'd been there, but I'd usually taken the train or flown it, and of course, it was coal country. And the experience of that trip led to a whole sort of series of revelations that uh, coal was at the heart of one very huge challenge for China, indeed for our own country as well. And that, as you all know very well, uh, Coal lies at the heart of the whole climate change challenge. In the case of a country like China, it's very primary because some 70 to 80 percent of its primary energy, electricity, comes from coal. In our own country, it's about 50 percent. And you all know the process. Uh, coal trapped conveniently, quietly, harmlessly in the ground for millions of years, gets dug up, burned, carbon goes into the atmosphere. Uh, and you get this whole chain reaction leading to uh, warming, to changes in climatic patterns, and uh, you all know what happens uh, on down the line. Uh, very complicated, has lots of influences on various uh, sort of biological cycles uh, when it comes back down uh, in various ways on, into the ocean, on the high plateaus where there are glaciers. And I want to talk a little bit today uh, about one area of the, 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 this chain of cause and effect in China, which we suddenly realize is of incomparable significance that nobody thought much of for a long, long time. 
Uh, and finally, you know, to, I want to conclude a little bit on the sort of seminal importance of China. Indeed, actually, it's the U.S. and China in the whole climate change wager. Because together, contributing close to 50% of all the greenhouse gas emissions, it is very easy to say and true that if the U.S. and China do not get in the game, and we are not in the game, uh, there is no game. The U.S. Uh, didn't ratify the Kyoto Protocols. It signed them and then unsigned them. In any event, uh, it, they probably would not have passed Cong uh, Congress at that point, just as Clinton was leaving and Bush was coming in. Uh, China signed them, but as a developing country, which did not oblige it to set any defined limits. And so both of these countries uh, sit at the heart of the matter of any multilateral effort to come to terms with climate change. And then, yes, the, unless the U.S. and China can find a way uh, to begin to partner on this question and begin to gain some momentum, I think it's going to be unthinkable that the meeting in December in Copenhagen, which follows the Kyoto meeting and will set up the regime for the next uh, uh, go around, uh, can be successful. And so these two countries are absolutely critical. And we have reached a kind of a tipping point moment uh, uh, in, in Sino-U.S. relations, indeed in American politics with the new president, and I think new recognitions in China about uh, the challenge that they confront, that it actually isn't a long-term challenge alone. It's a short-term challenge, and it has consequences. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And ultimately, to migrate up onto the Tibetan Plateau, this area which I have come to think of in a very different way uh, uh, in the last year or so than I did before. Now, if we back up a bit, um, you know, we know that uh, uh, before the Industrial Revolution began, this is just in a very general sense for those of you who aren't deep in the weeds on climate questions, um, that there were about 280 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. We've now gained 100 parts per million. We're around 380. Some people think 450 is the absolute limit. Other people think that's way too high and that by the time we get there, uh, there'll be so many uh, effects having been triggered by elevated temperatures that it will be catastrophic. So however you look at the magic number of where we have to stop, we're too far. And there's no way to arrest that number, even if the world girded its loins and did everything conceivable right now, it would still be uh, a huge time lag in what happens in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere and the parts per million of carbon and the effects that they, that they would have. So the question is, can we stay under 450? And the second, even more important question, is 450 too high? That's a number you'll hear a lot about. China is now the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world, uh, surpassing us by some accounts uh, last year. Now, on the other hand, if you look at their per capita emissions, they're five times less than, than America. And if you look at their historical emissions, they're infinitely lower than America. So there's a kind of an imbalance, an equation that has to be factored out between present emissions, per capita emissions, and historical burden that each country has put into the atmosphere. As I said at the outset, the primary uh, culprit in all of this uh, is coal. And the development that the world has experienced, which has been largely beneficial for many societies, including our own, has been fired in large measure by coal. And the US and China are both richly endowed uh, with coal. And there is no hope, no chance, doesn't matter what anybody does in the next 10 or 20 years that we are going to get away from coal. It's just simply too abundant and too cheap. So the question is really what can be done about coal, that's the heart, a heart of the matter, or a big piece of the, a big wedge in the pie chart of where the problem resides. China has 13% of the coal reserves of the world, and the US uh, has even more. China burned 2.74 billion tons of coal in 2008. Now, I think that'll go down this year because of the economic crisis that we see in the world. Indeed, uh, uh, some of you may have seen recent articles reporting on the air in Beijing, 
which uh, for years now sometimes can go for weeks without uh, the sun coming out or the blue sky appearing, has suddenly gotten better. Uh, partially through the efforts that were initiated during the Olympic Games, but I think largely through the economy. In China, there are some 14 to 15 deaths a day in coal mines. There's a huge number of mines, and as the price of coal goes up, more private mines, which are very poorly managed, very Dickensian, very few uh, uh, safety precautions, very poorly vent ventilated, uh, that skyrockets. So coal in China, and any of you who've driven across China or taken any trips outside of the cities, you will, you will know that coal figures very largely in the success of this country. 11% growth rate, 10% average for the last decade. Now it's down around 6%. That's a whole other set of problems that it poses for China in terms of social stability. But uh, at the heart of this matter is development, and at the heart of development lies energy, and the heart of energy lies coal. I think it would be fair to say that evolution of consciousness about this problem in China has been quite rapid and not too dissimilar from the evolution of our own consciousness in this country. This is a relatively new, new issue for all of us. We are all something of amateurs, although some scientists, of course, specialize in certain aspects of it. But the truth is, if you look at the climate change problem, the solution will have to involve a whole mosaic of efforts, from science to technology to finance to policy, uh, government involvement, civil society involvement. There's a whole kind of ecology of, of inputs that are going to be required to bring about a meaningful and rapid enough change to get anything done. And so in this sense, I think China has begun to realize, uh, uh, to have evolved away from their initial sense that the climate change issue, when people like me would come over and talk about it, they'd kind of roll their eyes and say, yeah, 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 this is sort of a, uh, 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 issue for you developed countries and you'd like to thrust it on us and slow down our development and this is a long time in the future and we really can't, can't be bothered with it right now. That has changed. It changed in a lot of ways. Uh, changed because I think the Chinese are beginning to realize that not only are there long-term consequences, there are short-term consequences. They're beginning to be affected by it sometimes in ways which may be just circumstantial, but since the, the, the whole notion of climate change and the threat as a threat has now been lofted, and in certain ways incorporated in, in official uh, doctrine and official statements, people tend to attribute things to climate change that may not actually be caused by them. So there's a very rapid, I think, evolution of thinking. However, China is still not willing to commit itself uh, to defined limits to a cap and trade system or a tax or something like that, of course, neither are we. And the reality about China's position is that they believe fervently that de the developed countries should take the lead and that their challenge is to follow. And so they are, in effect, waiting for the United States. And it's interesting, in conversations in China over the last six months, you know, I would talk about this, I would say that when the Obama administration comes in, this is after November, uh, there are going to be some big changes. And you could see sort of the wheels turning. And there was a lot of uh, 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 uncertainty. I mean, who were these people, Obama? Who were they going to bring in? And what were they going to do to us? What are they going to say to us? There was this sense not only that the United States should lead, but that China really was going to be acted upon because, in fact, there is a long history of that. Now, here there is a terrific paradox at work, and one that's not, I think, been properly uh, analyzed or appreciated. As the United States power, whether you look at it militarily, politically, financially, has diminished in the world, and this is a relatively recent phenomenon, what has curiously happened is psychologically the playing field has leveled somewhat. The old paradigm where the US would lecture at China, whether it was about how to run their finances, their stock markets, how to do human rights, how to develop, how to do this, how to do that, very subtly, in the last six months, this whole 
uh, uh, kind of interaction has changed. And in a way, this is a very hopeful thing. Because if there was anything that made the Chinese neuralgic about partnering or cooperating or listening to us was precisely that attitude of the West lecturing China. Now, I think they contemplate American mortality, frailty, weakness, both with a certain sense of relief, but also with a certain sense of trepidation. It's almost as like the, you know, you suddenly the adults vacate the building. And I think China's beginning to realize that, and this is, of course, I think all across the board in terms of its role in the world, that it is becoming a great power. It does have some responsibilities. It does need to lead. And a good place for it to begin to step out into this leadership uh, role in the world is by way of a partnership with the United <laughs> States. So this is a kind of a hopeful, incipient uh, uh, trend, which I think is worth watching. It's not completely developed, but I think it has some promise. Now, what the Chinese see now that they, we have Obama in office, Hillary Clinton goes over there and she tells them we have to collaborate. She <laughs> even went so far as to say that human rights shouldn't prevent us from cooperating and collaborating on other issues. We worked very closely with her on her speech. I think she went a little overboard there, but I take her point that there are other important things that these two countries have to transact between them if the world is going to uh, uh, be brought back from, from an, any number of brinks. This particular brink, of course, I think is the most menacing of all over the long run, which is climate change. So I think they begin to kind of get a sense that everything that they heard in the outside world wasn't simply a ruse to slow them down and heap the burden on them for something that they really didn't feel they were responsible for. And what are they seeing? Well, you remember uh, last winter, uh, there was this incredible freeze in South China. China had never seen anything like this in recorded history. It was ice, snow, the trains came to a halt, power plants had ran out of coal, the whole elect electricity grid went down. It got so bad that the premier of China, Wen Jiabao, had to go from, from Beijing all the way down to Canton. This was just before the Chinese New Year, where there were 800,000 people waiting in the train station to go home. It was a near riot. And he went out with a bullhorn, and he said, in effect, you know, we haven't done our job very well, and urged them to be orderly, to understand. And interestingly enough, the last time Wen Jiabao was seen with a bullhorn out in public was in Tiananmen Square in 1989 with Zhao Ziyang when he went out to try to calm the students down and get them to go home. It was a kind of a haunting moment. So that was one thing. And then, if you look at the Chinese press or you're in China and you hear things, a number of other things began to happen that, you know, again, were circumstantial but really did start to get people's attention. There was one case that summer in a, in a southern city called Zhanjiang, and I had to read this article in the paper again and again and again because I couldn't quite believe what I was reading. And what, I, what it, the article said, and it's subsequently been corroborated, that in one 24-hour period, this city had 29 inches of rain. Now you'll say, OK, one city, one aberrant weather pattern, no big deal. Well, it turns out the Chinese keep very good historical records that go back you know, centuries, millennia. And nothing like that had been recorded in this area ever. And then I saw another picture in a paper, again, circumstantial, but these things begin to add up. And in a country like China, where there is a kind of a highly evolved notion of sort of fate, they have an impact. There was a picture in the paper of about 100 people pushing a jet aircraft, what looked like across a lake in, in Tianjin. And um, the article said that there had been th this in North China on the North China Plain, which had been in a state of drought, dire drought. What had happened was North China and Shandong province had had one of these freak storms. It had dropped more rain than at any time in Chinese history on this airport and a lot of other places. And this was the effect of it. But again, paradoxically, the rain came during a time of drought. It sort of washed away. 
uh, didn't recharge aquifers, which are falling on the average of three to four feet a year now across North China. And uh, you begin to see more and more things like this occurring. And it is very, uh, I think, unsettling for the leadership. Uh, they're not quite sure you know, to what to attribute this, but it does gather their attention. Now, water is key in this recognition of the way in which climate change is affecting China and the, and the way in which I think the leaders of China are beginning to understand the effects of this problem. There's been a diminution of rainfall on the North China Plain. And this has led to these droughts. And this is the breadbasket of China. This is the wheat growing district, traditionally dry to be sure. The south is the rice growing region, very wet, sort of south of the Yangtze. But in North China, it's dry and it's wheat growing. And they've had for the past 10 years a series of really serious droughts. Now, what's the remedy to these droughts? Well, the remedy is a project called the Nan Shui Bei Dia, the South North Water Transfer Project. Now, you may never have heard of this, but it's twice as big as the Three Gorges Dam. And what it is, it's as if you had decided one Saturday you were going to call a plumber into your house and you were going to replumb your house. What the North South Water Transfer Project is to connect up via three canals the Yangtze River and its watershed to the Yellow River, which loops way up through Mongolia and then down across the North China Plain, and is what really was the foundation for much of Chinese civilization, because it brought the waters, brought water down from the Tibetan Plateau, down from Qinghai, up through Mongolia and down across the North China Plain. Once it was called China's sorrow, because it flooded so often. Now, in many years, in the summertime, it ceases to debouche at all out into the ocean. All the water's taken out of it. And so to remedy for this deficit, which admittedly is caused not only by drought, but by overtaxing its resources, they have decided to build this massive three canal plan. One of the canals is, is the third one, which hasn't been built yet, is going to tap in way up high and loop around to North China and have to go actually underneath the Yellow River. Now, have you seen the Yellow River? I mean, this is no small task of engineering. It's also going to have to be pumped up over uh, uh, one or two major mountain ranges. So this is big time stuff. The first canal uh, was rooted by the old Grand Canal. They kind of cleaned it out, and they're sending water north. The second one is going to come in from a tributary of the Yangtze and go to North China and Beijing. Um, but this is, this is, you know, I mean, the, the, the world has never seen such contortions to solve a natural problem before. But this is what China is confronting. And this is how you know they're worried. And there also is a huge uh, sort of effort all across North China, each county, each province, to shoot silver iodide, you know, uh, uh, rockets, uh, artillery fire, plain sowing clouds, and there, there's even evolving a whole sort of field of law and of competition between cities, because as wind blows clouds down, and one city tries to seed the clouds and grab all the rain, the next city and the next county and the next province, of course, are going to be deprived of that sort of airborne riparian right. So we've reached a kind of a crisis level uh, in, in, uh, in water. China has 757 cubic meters of water per person. That's one-fourth of the world average. But on the North China Plain, it's only 300 cubic meters a year. It's a very, very small amount of water. You can't dig a well on the North China Plain anymore by hand. It used to be every village had one. Now you have to go with heavy equipment and drill an artesian well. So we begin to see them becoming conscious around these very concrete problems. Uh, 400 of China's 667 large cities. And I should say, China has 160 cities of over a million people. You know how many the US has? I think it's six or seven. It's just give you an idea of the scale of it all. 65% of all the water is used in agriculture, and 20% of this is wasted through inefficiency. Industrial uses are 24%, uh, and there's only under half of that is recycled. So 
this is a real challenge for China. Now, I want to get up to a very concrete area to describe to you one of the places where climate change in China is really focusing people's attention. But we're really on the early, sort of in the early stages of, of awareness, both in China and around the world. And that is on the Tibetan Plateau. Now, Tibet, um, I wrote a book about the, this region and you know, the fascination that Westerners had for it. it. Used to be described as the blank place on the map. You know, it had, didn't get mapped until very late. Then it was sort of a, a spiritual epicenter. And then people imagined maybe there was copper, zinc, gold, something else up there. Otherwise, why was it so important? Uh, but it was actually a place of no great actual consequence. Symbolic importance, yes, and the Chinese are hanging on to it for dear life. It's a very difficult political issue. But of late, we've begun to appreciate it as something entirely different. And that is uh, a place, sort of the reservoir, for every major river system uh, you can think of of any consequence in, in Asia, from the Indus uh, all the way to the Yellow River in the north. The Salween, the Mekong, the Yangtze, the Brahmaputra, you name it. All of these rivers rise on the Tibetan Plateau. It starts at the Hindu Kush above, sort of in the upper part of Afghanistan. You, you move around to the Karakoram, K2 above Pakistan, then the sort of the, the whole arc of the Himalayas that, that uh, rims the top of India, uh, Sikkim, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and then heads north. Uh, around Yunnan province and Sichuan, and then ultimately ends in the grasslands of Qinghai province to the north of uh, northwest uh, China. What this area now has begun to mean to more and more people as they, as they begin to look at it with a different lens is this is the place where these rivers uh, uh, derive uh, a good deal of their, their, their flow. Now, it isn't simply that all the water comes from the Tibetan Plateau. Much of it comes from monsoon rainfall, seasonal. But why the Tibetan Plateau is so important is because when the monsoons stop, and in dry seasons, that is when the 45,000 glaciers of, of the Tibetan Plateau begin to, to melt and release their meltwater into these rivers, thus evening the seasonal flows. In some rivers, it's 50% of the flow. In other rivers, it's, it's below 5%. So it, it isn't as if when all the glaciers are gone, the rivers will never flow. It is that they will not flow all year long. In the meanwhile, as the temperatures rise, the glaciers are melting faster, and everybody's pretty happy. A lot of nice water, sometimes floods. And this also is an area which is very poorly understood in terms of uh, climate, in terms of the interaction of you know, temperatures on monsoons, on rainfall. But temperatures at high altitudes, at least in the Tibetan Plateau, are rising much faster than the global average. And this means these, the glaciers uh, are melting at a much, they don't melt at a linear rate either. As glaciers melt, the land around them, the, the, the rock faces, the mountainsides that are exposed then begin to absorb heat, and they melt even faster. And in fact, when glaciers melt, all of this I hasten to add I'm not an expert on, but I've be, be begun to learn. Water tends to flow down crevasses. It lubricates the underside of the, the glacier, and the glaciers start to slip. And you get these massive uh, lakes where glaciers used to be backed up behind glacial moraines. And one of the dangers uh, of, of the, the rapidly melting glaciers is what they call glacial, uh, glacial lake outburst floods, where the glacial moraines will break. And you'll have these huge lakes suddenly just deluging down a river. But the, the, the problem of the melting glaciers, I, I would say, is the most frightening one, uh, because scientists now understand that through ice core sampling uh, 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 on the Tibetan Plateau, that the glaciers have not been building up mass since the 50s. And you can see that very clearly in the ice cores. You know, it snows, but more and more of the precipitation on the Tibetan Plateau because of elevated temperatures comes down in the form of rain, not snow. 
So it can't pack up. And in fact, rain melts glaciers, uh, whereas snow adds to them. So the estimate now is that, that by 2050, 2060, who knows, every estimate that I've seen is superseded by a new estimate that's more dire, more rapid, and, and uh, uh, more, uh, more alarming. Uh, because as I suggested, they don't simply melt in a linear fashion. They, they, meant, they melt in an exponential faster, more and more rapidly as time goes on. I think many of you know that uh, in the last 11 years, we've had 10 of the hottest summers. This is a, a global phenomenon. Um, the World Glacier Monitoring Service, which collects data on 100 glaciers around the world, found that 2005 and 6 was the worst loss uh, for ice mass on record. This last year, I think, was the third worst. And this isn't just limited to Tibet. You go to the Alps, you go to the Andes, you have a similar phenomenon. Glacier Park is soon not going to have any glaciers at all. Uh, but we don't really rely on that water the way Asia relies on the water from Asia, uh, from the Tibetan Plateau. So this is a problem. What's in the ground, coal, goes up as flue gas, as carbon, methane, twice as, as, as deleterious in terms of its heat trapping capacity than carbon. Climate, uh, there's a warming, climate changes. Then we get a whole other phenomena up in the Tibetan Plateau, which is the melting of the permafrost. And this is not only damaging to climate because, uh, uh, um, you know, it, it, it releases water and it lowers the level at which water remains perched on top of the permafrost, which is exactly the level to which the grasses on these very fragile areas, you know, millions and millions of acres of grassland on the northern side of the Tibetan Plateau. And so the roots of the grass are not equipped to go deep enough to get the water that follows the melting permafrost down. Moreover, when permafrost melts, you get decomposition. Permafrost is like a freezer, freezes the, the, the organic matter so it can't release methane. When it begins to melt, uh, then you get decomposition and you get the release of methane. You also begin to get desertification, partially because rainfall patterns have changed on this vast grassland area that's inhabited by nomads. We have a whole project with nomads and the Tibetan uh, sort of Qinghai grasslands where we've been talking with them about what they've observed over their lifetimes of the last 30 or 40 years, not only in terms of the glaciers they've seen melt, but what's happened to pasture land, to grasslands. And what's happened is that the rainfall patterns have been disrupted so that whereas it used to rain rather more steadily during the, the wet season, uh, you know, drizzle kind of, now it's raining in sort of uh, uh, thunder showers. You get very episodic uh, rainfall that uh, comes and puts a lot of water on the ground, and then you don't get anything for two weeks, and thus you, thus you get a drying of the grasslands, and then you get desertification. So there's that whole phenomenon going on uh, on the uh, sort of north face of the Tibetan Plateau. The, the ice mass is estimated to have decreased by 4.5% over the last uh, 20 years. Now, that may not sound, by, sound like a lot, except, in fact, it should be building. And instead, it's melting. And it seems to be melting at more rapid rates uh, each year. Um, the temperature difference between the average temperature rise per uh, decade on the Tibetan Plateau is 0.6 degrees Celsius. But the global average is 0.7 degrees Celsius for the century. So there's a huge disparity. But again, people really incompletely understand this because there are not a lot of meteorological stations up there. There's some very good Chinese glaciologists. But of course, it's often the Chinese government doesn't want to panic people. And so in a, in a world where there is controlled media, the question is, what do you do? In our own society, there's a kind of a presumption that if you feed people information, they will both push their government and support their government in taking measures to ameliorate the problem. China is not quite at that state. Interestingly enough, 
China does have a real fluorescence of civil society. And the environmental movement is one area where there are more civil society NGOs than any other area, I think, except possibly public health. But still, there's a great ambiguity about civil society because civil society is independent. And it does push the government. That's the job of civil society. And the Chinese Communist Party is very wary about allowing any element of society to become sufficiently uh, independent and well instated that they might be able to exercise undue uh, pressure in a way that might challenge them. And so you have a curiously altered form of a government's relation to civil society as we are accustomed to it in a, in a more open society. And this is a problem. So it's always important for any environmental NGO that might be talking about melting glaciers, talking about increased or de decreased river flow, talking about dams, all of these things. They always have to keep a well-sanded fingertip in the wind to see which way the wind is blowing and to get a sense of what can the market bear? What can they get away with doing, with saying? When is too much too much and when will they get them closed down? And that's a, a very difficult ecology of its own. So we find that this place, in a certain sense, is a Tibetan plateau is a kind of canary in the mine shaft, one that's very incompletely observed. We have a project uh, at the Asia Society, and, I, and I, in a moment we'll show you just a few minutes uh, of it. Uh, a number of years ago, I made several films with a mountain climber who uh, has since been up Mount Everest five times, summited five times. He took the IMAX camera up Everest and did the, that 3D wraparound movie, which I'm sure many of you had. It was a spectacular film. Um, and he began to, his, his, initially his passion was to get to the top of things. That was, his, that was his thing. Mountain climber, mountain man. You know, not a deep thinker, just get up. <laughs> He spent a lot of time in the Himalayas, the Karakoram climbing, and he suddenly began to, 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 to find himself noticing that the glaciers were disappearing because he would go back year after year around Everest. And he started a project, which we've teamed up with him on now, where he's gone back into the, into, to get these archives uh, from 75, 100 years ago. He got all the photos of the Mallory expeditions to Everest in the 1920s. And it turns out that they did these huge photos of the Rombach and the Carta Glacier, and you know, sort of giant format of photographs. So David Brashears goes up. He spends weeks doing this. It's very expensive, I might add. And he goes and he finds exactly the ledge on which Mallory stood in 1921 and his photographer and shot the Rombach Glacier, and he takes another photo. He's now at Kachinjunga, which is between Nepal and Sikkim. This is another huge ice field. This was photographed in 1908. The Duke of Abruzzi in Italy was a mountain enthusiast. In fact, there's in the K2 and the Karakoram, there's the Abruzzi uh, Ridge named after him. So he went there with a cartographer, and he took these huge glass plate photographs of the ice fields. So we went and got them in Italy. And now David Bashirs is back there right now doing these historical match photographs. Then he's going to K2 in the Karakoram in July. And then later in the year, he's going to the Tianshan Mountains, which are on sort of the north side of the Taklamakan Desert between Kazakhstan and, 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 and China. And this is kind of the most graphic representation that I've seen of the consequences of what's going on. And it's very alarming, very alarming. Um, because you begin to, 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 to understand that these rivers, uh, I'm going up in three weeks to an area on the Tibetan Plateau in, in uh, western Yunnan province where the Yangtze River, the Mekong River, and the Salween River all begin within a very narrow band and huge snow-capped mountains and, and, and ice fields. So you begin to see that this area, which seemed to be of no consequence, suddenly is a kind of headquarters for, uh, I don't know, nobody, I've seen so many different numbers, I hesitate to use them, but two billion people 
or in some way reliant on, on these rivers. And uh, they are in jeopardy. And what's doubly difficult about this problem, and this gets back to the theme of the talk tonight, is this is not just China's problem. Yes, China will be affected. But you know, there is no law, there's an international law of the sea. Nobody much pays attention to it, but it's there. But there is no adopted international law of rivers. The Mekong flows down through Yunnan province, and there are 13 new dam sites the Chinese are considering uh, building on it. And then it goes down past Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia. All those countries are dependent on it. And yet China has it by the throat upstream. And the world has it by the throat up at the glaciers. China can't solve this problem alone. One atom of one molecule of carbon emitted here in Berkeley is exactly the same as one emitted in Beijing. It doesn't go through customs. <laughs> you know, it doesn't care about boundaries. Now, the Chinese have a very sort of 19th century notion of sovereignty. You don't interfere in my affairs. I don't interfere in your affairs. Stay out of our internal affairs. We don't want to go there. Uh, Sudan, you know the story. They're very loath to see international humanitarian intervention anywhere. Burma, we don't do politics. We just trade. You know, Iran, all of these sort of bad actor countries. But China, I think, is slowly beginning to change, too. And we see signs of this, for instance, in uh, the Six Party Talks over North Korea. I mean, China has definitely intruded in the internal affairs of North Korea. Not to the extent we would like them to, but they've been quite responsible. They've been, played a quite a constructive role in that very sort of critical set of talks. So they, too, are beginning to change. But the question is, uh, can we both change together rapidly enough to form some sort of a united front on this issue? Now, President Obama has taken a very different position than President Bush. Uh, and he has, I think, set the track in the right direction for a collaboration with China on, on this question. I'm going over to China tomorrow for a meeting with 100 people from America and China to talk about, all right, Hillary Clinton says cooperate. Obama says let's get together. What do we do? Where do we begin? What's the project? Now, we've, we've uh, put out a little road map making some suggestions. You could look at the grid. You could look at carbon capture and sequestration. You could look at energy efficiency, sustainable sources of energy. There are a lot of things. But it, it seems to me, unless we do find a way in very short order for these two countries to really put some muscle behind this, um, it's going to be too late. I'm not particularly optimistic, I have to say. But I think uh, it's, this is the time, if there was a time, uh, to, to try to put one's shoulder to the wheel to see if we can't practically uh, find ways where the two countries can do something together. Because if we don't, I think it's very unlikely that this, this problem will be solved. China's growth rate is shrunk almost by half. They're very worried about social stability. They're very worried about employment. The last thing they want to do is to raise the cost of energy. The last thing they want to do is to be, have a whole new burden thrust upon them at this time when they have their eye fixed on survival and stability and continued progress. This is a challenge indeed. And I think it's one that the developed countries are going to have to recognize that we can't simply wait for them because they're going to wait for us. And that's what we've been doing for eight years. They waited for us, we waited for them. We blamed them, said, we're not signing because you're not playing. And they said, fine, we're not playing either. And nothing much has happened. So I think um, enough said. Uh, but this will be the challenge of the next 10 years. And if the United States and China can find a way to, co to collaborate, I do think the other issues which tend to upset us and, just, and throw the relationship, as, 
as we refer to it, off the tracks, will also be somewhat easier to deal with, whether it's human rights or spy ships or missiles through embassy windows or whatever things come along, trade. Um, so that, I think, is the challenge. And uh, uh, we'll watch over the next six months. These are critical months leading up to Copenhagen to see if there is some way that this collaboration, which now has been called for, whether it can be made flesh, whether the word can be made flesh. That's simply put. Now listen, by way of ending, I, I want to show you a little bit of this project I mentioned uh, because it's pretty graphic. And you'll see David Bashir's talking about it a bit uh, uh, because this uh, uh, will, will show in, in the most graphic way what's happening to these glaciers. Let's see if we can get this. Maybe while we're, uh, while we're waiting for it to come on, anybody have a question or a thought we could, yeah, right here. Well, the Chinese are very, very uh, unreceptive to the idea of what they call defined limits, which cap and trade is in, a, is in effect a form of the defined limits. But I think the challenge is for the developed countries to accept defined limits of some manner or other, and then work with countries like China and India to grab some of what's known as the low-hanging fruit. And believe me, there's a lot of it. China is something like nine times less energy efficient than Japan, four to five times less energy efficient than we are. They're trying very hard to increase their energy efficiency per unit of GDP. They need a lot of help. Another area where they could use immense amounts of help is, is in gathering of accurate statistics so they know what's happening and where it's happening. They don't really have that. I mean, this is something, again, where developed countries could help. Power grids. Curiously, we both have rather outmoded power grids that aren't particularly receptive to you know, episodic for, uh, sources of, of sustainable energy like wind or solar. Uh, and uh, it, it, this is another area where I think a concerted effort uh, uh, might be helpful. And it certainly would be symbolic. So I think there are many areas where before you push China to a defined limit, where huge progress could be made. But the reality is, because of the, 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 the um, um, imbalance between the amount of historical emissions that the United States has put into the, I think it's five times more. I can't remember the exact figure. I have it here someplace. But uh, because of that, uh, you know, we have a, a, a disparity in what I think needs to be expected from developing and developed countries. Yes? Are there any areas in which China is an innovator? I mean, I've read about solar and, and thin film solar that mm -hmm. they actually push the limits there. Are there other places where they're going that they can innovate and bring something to the country? Yes, and I mean, they're, they're, I think they're, they're working very hard on wind, solar, but you know, the, the bitter, and even nuclear, but the bitter reality is no matter how hard they work on these particular forms of sustainable energy, they're not going to comp comprise a large percentage of the total demand anytime soon. We're still, we're still back at coal. And uh, so I, I, I think one area of profitable collaboration would be uh, carbon capture and sequestration. I mean, if there was a place in the world where you could experiment and do it quickly and scale up some of these technologies, try out some of these new, new, new uh, uh, technologies that we, we have you know, on the rack, we just haven't put them into any sort of scalable uh, use, China's the place. Uh, yes? Uh, we're up. OK. So I think this will, hopefully we'll hear some sound. What I'm seeing when I make these trips um, to Mount Everest, 
the glaciers to the east, north, west, and south sides is something really astonishing. They're just disappearing. They're just vanishing. In fact, I think the uh, what, what I'll call the uh, the photo exhibit someday is you know Everest uh, vanishing glaciers. What's really shocking is that it's it's how uh, the, the rapid rate of retreat you know, over the last um, 80, 80 years. What's really exciting about this research uh, for me is the uh, is the peek back into history I get. Because uh, the record that I come back with relies on having um, my, my record matched against an earlier record. I look at the images, a lot of the mountains that I'm going to I'm familiar with, and then I reoccupy the same exact spot from where the photo was taken, take the same picture, and then match them together. In my journeys uh, uh, across Tibet in documenting glacial retreat, of course I'm interested in the impact it has on, on the local people. And I would say that right now the impact, the greater impact is in global warming and how it's affecting their growing seasons, the, the time of their harvest, the time of the, the planting, uh, how the grass grows high on the plateau, uh, things like that. because. In a, in, in a bit of an, uh, an irony here, as the glaciers are melting, they are providing more water at the moment because there is still plenty of water locked up in the ice in these high altitude glaciers, and there will be for many years to come. So uh, the, the local response to melting glaciers is that there's, there's more water now. The response to the increase in the uh, average uh, temperatures is not good, and they do notice that more because fundamentally they are farmers, they live off the land, they know the crop cycles, they know the growing season um, uh, ex exquisitely well. I took this photo down here from uh, in 2008. Uh, it was the same uh, place that a photographer had stood to get this picture in 1921. And what, I, what you look for here is something, the line of the glacier here in 1981 on the West Rongbuk glacier sitting below Mount Everest has now dropped from here to here. It's dropped over 350 vertical feet. And down here it's just as dramatic. Um, again, I'm, I'm standing where a gentleman stood in 1921, Captain Wheeler. His photo shows this rock island exposed to this height. If you come down here to this picture, the glacier used to be here. It's dropped 400 feet further up the glacier, and that's true all the way across here, all the way up the West Rongbuk Glacier. It's just uh, losing mass vertically, and just, it's not sinking, it's just all going up into the air, this water, or flowing down uh, out um, into rivers and streams. Pretty, it's pretty sobering stuff uh, when you see what's, what's actually happening and you recognize there is a, is a fuse on this. And uh, these glaciers are not going to come back anytime soon. I understand that uh, it's beef production or meat production is a huge uh, contributor to greenhouse <coughs> gases. Do you hear them in China talking about well, maybe the U.S. should cut down its uh, consumption of Meat. Well, you know, it's interesting. China, because it doesn't like to be lectured, it doesn't want a lecture. So you, it's very rare that you will see at least an official Chinese expressing views about what the U.S. should do and shouldn't do, because they don't want to have it done to them. I mean, I think we, there are many, many things that we could do to, to arrest uh, global warming, and the cattle industry is only one of, one of many things. Uh, 
But you know, we're only slowly becoming aware of these things. I mean, a few years ago, who, who thought much about this? Uh, we, we, there's a very rapid learning curve that's happening. And I have to say, you know, the, the biggest problem in this country is not the new government, it's the Congress. And now we see that in the Congress, suddenly Obama had his cap and trade bill, you know, hidden in the budget. And he thought he had enough votes passed the budget by a simple majority, and suddenly there are 10, sta 10 coal state Democrats who don't, not so happy about cap and trade. So how that's all going to shake out, we don't know. But it's of, it's of critical importance to someone like me as I troop over to China and say, all right, what are you going to do? Here's what we're going to do. We don't know what we're going to do. Now, there's an interesting wrinkle to all of this. We're talking at lunch about this. Uh, under the Bush administration, the Supreme Court did find that carbon was a pollutant. And Bush did nothing about it. He just let the ruling sit. He didn't uh, try to, you know, to, 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 to act upon it. Now, uh, Obama is acting on it. So there's this second path of the Environmental Protection Agency that is treating carbon like sulfur dioxide and will proceed to try to limit it. And in effect, what that may say to the coal state Democrats, you don't like cap and trade? Just wait till the EPA gets their hooks on you. <laughs> so th there's actually a rather positive, we have a little bit of the marketplace working here. You don't like this? Take that. You don't like that? Better get used to this. So we'll have to see. So far, Obama's been pretty good. Uh, he's stuck to his guns at a very, very difficult time when it'd be just easy as the devil to throw climate change overboard. In the back. You know, there are a lot of different actions that this country could take internationally, nationally, state, private sector. Would the Chinese, do you think, respond more to one type of action or another if they're looking to us to, to leave? You know, that, that's a really interesting question, and the truth is all of this is happening now. And we don't quite know because we didn't do anything yet. We just talk. So until we actually do something, it's not going to be easy for us to get a real read off of China. Now, we're going to have this big discussion on Thursday in Beijing with a lot of the top climate negotiators and scientists. And, you know, the, the, our intention is to say, all right, what are you willing to do? And I think their reaction is going to be, all right, what are you going to do? So th th this is, we're kind of sniffing around each other right now. But we certainly have gotten their attention. Uh, and I think we're, we're getting out on the dance floor here. We'll see what happens. Uh, it's going to take some, there's really nobody yet in the, in the American government who really understands China and climate. So that has to be worked out. There's some very good people who do climate, and Todd Stern, the negotiator, is a really smart guy. Um, you know, um, they have some good China people, but it's finding that strange blend. And I don't consider myself qualified by, I mean, I, this is, I, I am a real Johnny come lately to this, but I'm smart enough as a good journalist to know when I'm onto a good story. <laughs> and, and this is a good and scary story. Considering uh, the possibility of uh, perhaps all the industrialized nations forming sort of a Marshall Plan where you uh, retrofit coal-fired plants to sequester the CO2, uh, could that not uh, be acceptable to China that uh, it wouldn't, they wouldn't have to undergo the cost of the investment and so on and so forth? Well, it would be in all of our interests. Would that be comparable, say, a billion dollars per plant? I think we, we all have dreams of a kind of a neo-Marshall plan for this, that, and the other. But frankly speaking, I don't see it happening. Of course, the Chinese would love to get some free money and some free technology and to have us help them solve the problem. But I don't think that the Western world is going to launch that kind of a program. The question is, what short of that could we do that would be actually meaningful, not just Band-Aids, not just... 
Well, it might be. He's put some very good people. He's got Steve Chu in the energy department, John Holdren as the science advisor, Todd Stern as a climate negotiator. I mean, he's foliating the government with some good people. And there's some money being thrown around because of the stimulus packages. But it's a little early to know just how all of this might coalesce into something with China. And then you've got to remember, Americans don't much care for the Chinese communists. You know, China's not very popular in America. So you've got that whole problem. Anything that has to pass the Congress, watch out. And then you have the Chinese extremely neuralgic about the idea that before we even pass a carbon cap, we're talking about penalizing imports from other countries that don't have the price of carbon factored into them. In other words, cheap steel from China coming into America where they have to pay. So, I mean, you know, there, there, there's an awful lot of places where this thing could run right off the rails or never get on the rails. Yes, in the back. Well, how, do you, how do you explain the fact that in the last 40 years, the temperature has increased only 0 0.002 degrees to the warmer side by the satellites operated by NASA, by real meteorologists, measuring the temperature from the satellite to the Earth. This such a slight amount, and the oceans have only risen 0 0.01 inches per year for the last 40 years. How do you explain well, listen, first I should say, I, I am, this is not Hansen, a... Hansen, another thing. Hansen, the guy that predicted, that predicted in front of Congress in 1970 right. that the temperature was today supposed to be four times hotter than it really is. He's, he's a, an employee of NASA. And it didn't turn out to be four times hotter than it really is. Well, there are probably 20. Yeah, there are probably 20 people in the room here who could give you chapter and verse on temperatures. One thing I, I can say that these temperatures that you hear are usually global averages. And what they don't often account for is quite you know, large disparities between certain regions. The other thing that, that you have to remember is. The Tibetan Plateau, which is called the Third Pole, because it's the third largest you know, ice mass uh, area of ice mass in the world besides the two poles, it's very different from the poles in the sense when they melt, that water just goes into the ocean. Nobody's much dependent on it. You may submerge Bangladesh, you may lose Shanghai and the Maldives, but OK. But <laughs> the water coming down off the Tibetan Plateau is water for two billion people. So if the temperatures are actually, I mean, you can just, I mean, have a look at these pictures. How do you explain a 400-foot drop in the Rongbuk Glacier in 75 years? But, but, they're, but they're also, they're taking the temperature from the Earth's temperatures. When the Russians, when they went from... Well, listen, I, I, I don't want to, I'm, 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 I'm not an authority on, on global temperatures. I do, I do know that when I see a... When a glacier disappears, it's cause for alarm. Maybe we have time for one more, and then Maybe one more. Yeah, yeah. any, any uh, right here. Um, we heard a lot about projects in China, a little bit about cap and trade. Um, do you see the CDM clean development mechanism as being something that's really greasing the wheels between the, for the communication between the U.S. and China? I mean, China's got I think over fifty percent of the world's yeah. Well, CDM, Clean Development Mechanism, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it, is the way Europe sells uh, offsets to China. If a factory in China is willing to do uh, clean tech, it offsets the dirty tech in Europe, and the Chinese factory gets money. And the Chinese factory has, has gotten a lot of money. But it's not working very well. The critique of the clean development mechanism, and I think it'll be swept away and redone, is that it's, they're giving money to people who would have done that anyway. So there's not much of a net gain. And so China loves it. But uh, I think the EU is not quite so happy about it. Well, listen, uh, thank you for your time, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. We have the European Commission right here. We do. Would the European Commission like to speak? I think we are concerned about CDM, you're right. We've put a lot of money into China, and the questions are whether it's actually really achieved anything. There are many, many skeptics to CDM. The question I'd like to ask, actually, is even as the central government in China starts to get a grip of this, and they are fairly technically competent, 
what's your feel about their actual ability to get the Chinese on the ground in the cities and regions? I mean, it's a governance problem. Is there any chance that they can actually move the rest of the country? Well, this is a real problem, the, the differentiation between the, the central government and the provincial and county governments where, you know, money talks and the party uh, can do things. It can't do everything. So the question is, what would it take at the central level to actually articulate a policy that would have binding effect at the provincial and county levels where people are geared up to make money and to develop? The central government has adopted in the last couple of years an expression called, it used to be there were fajan, development, was something you heard everywhere in China. Everything's development this, development zones, this, that, and the other. They've changed it now to kush, or fajan, scientific development. And what they mean by that is they don't want to cancel out the glory of development by stigmatizing it. They want to kind of subtly reinvent the notion that the science part involves sort of environmentally sounder development practices. So they are beginning to evolve. And I think actually, if you compared them to the Bush administration, they're, they were infinitely more enlightened. <laughs> there was a paradox in China, because if you look at the Chinese pyramid, the leadership at the top was quite smart. The provincial and the, <laughs> environmentally speaking, the provincial and the county level people were much more refractory and much more resistant. And the people at the bottom were relatively, not, relatively uninformed because of the nature of the media. In the United States, it was exactly the opposite. You had the top of the pyramid was totally brain dead. You had the states doing all sorts of interesting things, but running off in 10 different directions and trying to get together. And then on the bottom, I think you have a very rapidly evolving state of public consciousness. Uh, and it, 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 but now this is changing a little. So maybe there'll be greater symmetry between the two systems, and we'll see what happens. OK. Has the EU spoken? Uh, well, I'm afraid these problems are probably too large to fully explore in an hour or two, but uh, I I think that we're all very grateful uh, for this uh, fascinating and very sobering uh, examination of the issues. And I also wanted to thank all of you who came out here tonight uh, for this event. Good night. <laughs>